Judges, chapter 16, the man and the life of Samson. Samson, name means like the sun, shine like the sun. Called of God to the Nazarite vow, a vow of separation or a purpose given from the Lord. Walked with God sometimes, pursued the flesh at other times. We saw him through the temptation of a wicked woman named Delilah go down into the place of Gaza. He believed that as the Philistines came after he had violated and broken his Nazarite vow to God, shaved his head, she awoke, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He arrogantly assumed and said, I will go out as at other times before, and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes and blinded him, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with bronze chains, and made him a grinder in the prison. What a hopeless, sad, dark scenario this is. This is the cul-de-sac of where sin leads. This is what sin does. This is where the journey of sin that seems so exciting when you're on the road ends. This is the dead end street in a prison, a prison of pain, of misery, of blindness, of chains, humiliation and defeat. Samson has found it. Many here today have experienced seasons of life. Maybe you're in one where you have found the dead-end street of sinful desires. And one of the greatest words in the Bible appears in verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. Man, I wonder, and I, I, it's going to be hard not to preach a whole sermon on that word right now. Preached it before, we'll preach it again. I wonder how many howevers we have sitting here. You have pursued sin, you've fallen to the tricks of the enemy, you have gone after the fleshly desires of a sinful heart, and you've found yourself in the prison grinding out torturously where sin has taken you, and you feel as though there is no use for me, I have no worth, I have no value, I have no use from the Lord, yet, however, there is God, and little by little, the power of God through your repentant, broken, sorrowful heart, calling out to the Lord for restoration, reaches down, and the hair of your head begins to grow again. The purpose of God begins to well up in your heart yet again. There is Samson, Finally, in a place of humility before the Lord, and something is stirring in Samson's heart. Upstairs, out in the the, the temple floor, a party has been called. People are assembling, drinks are being poured, perhaps music was playing. Entertainment is happening, laughing, celebration. The place is a packed house, packed house. People are sitting on the roof, the Bible says. The Philistines have a bash going upstairs. Verse 23. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God. Dagon, he appears once in a while in the Bible. He's an idol. He's a false god. He cannot see. He cannot hear. He cannot save. He has no power. This is a demonically inspired false form of worship. Some people call him the half man, half fish god. I don't know if he's a merman or what's going on here, but (laughs) Dagon, the merman, is upstairs, the statue, and they offer a party to him. And to rejoice, verse 23 says, they're pumped, for they said, 
Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. Boy, they just own everything right now. Our God, our enemy, our hands. And when the people saw him, Samson, they praised their God. They, they see the Dagon being victorious over him, and they praised their God, for they said yet again, our God has given our enemy into our hands. <coughs> Excuse me. Even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. Now, look at that loyalty. Look at that worship, that celebration of where they believe the victory over Samson has come from. Back to verse 23. The lords of the Philistines, what's it say? Dagon, their God. Verse 23 again, our God. Verse 24, they praised their God. God. Verse 24, our God. Over and over, this is what they believe has done it. They believe that the reason Samson is in the dungeon, chained up, blind, and is a grinder in defeat, they pronounce victory over him. They believe the sole reason is their false God that they have sought power from has gained victory over Samson. And they have thrown a party to Dagon in celebration of, it says, the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us, him being defeated. How exciting for them. They say the words, our enemy, our destroyer, and they attribute that <coughs> to Samson. The many times that they have gone out against Samson, or Samson has come to them, and the Spirit of the living God has come upon him. They lost soundly. And so they say that Samson, who has done this, he is defeated. When they call out Samson as the destroyer, they are wrong. Their fight has not ever been with Samson. It is God. When they have Samson in that dungeon and they throw this party, make no mistake about it, they hate him. They despise the mention of his name. They have plotted his death over and over. They have failed all but this once. They have laid in wait at the city gate until midnight. They were defeated. They have tried to attack him. They have tried to come against him. They've sent a thousand men to him. They were defeated. They have come in. They have bound him with ropes, with cords. They've woven the hair of his head into locks and in a loom. And they've come against him. They've come against him. They've come against him. And they were defeated every time. They hate Samson. They hate him. They despise him. And they celebrate his destruction. But understand this. It is not Samson that they hate. Miss Brenda, you're my hero. She doesn't even have to do that. She's here for the school. Thank you, Miss Brenda. You're awesome, dude. I don't know if you're a dude, but dude. (laughs) Thank you. What they despise and where the fight has been is between them and their rebellion against Almighty God working through Samson as his tool. God has used Samson as a tool of righteous judgment and wrath against their rebellion, the Philistines' rebellion and idol worship against God. But they hate Samson, and they blame him for it, and they want him dead. That is true then, and it is true now. The world, society, the sinful, the rebellious, the unrighteous, they hate God. Understand, They hate the Lord. And the Bible says that Christ is in us, the hope of glory, and they hate you because they hate him. They're not confused most of the time. They're not unknowing. They hear the righteous standard of God. They see the holiness. They see the light in you. And John 3 says they loved the deeds of darkness more than the light, and they hate the light. You are the light. Christ is the light, and they hate him and you for it. The world hates God. They say, well, I believe in God. 
I, I believe, you believe in God? I do, I do. I, I, I believe in a general sense. I'm spiritual. I, no, not the true God. They hate God. When they get a glimpse, when they feel the power and they feel the conviction, they hear the true standard of God's holy righteousness. When they catch a glimpse of that, they hate him. And if they could and when they can, gouge out the eyes, chain up his servants and humiliate them to death, believe me, they would and they do. Because they hate God. They hated him then. And the Philistines of our day, the idol worshipers, the celebratory bashes that they throw to immorality and sin and unrighteousness of every kind, every abomination, when they catch a glimpse of God's people, the Samsons of now, they hate him. Hold your spot in Judges. Go to Romans chapter 1. Way to the right in the New Testament, a different time, a different place, a different people, same God, same sin. They lifted themselves up into gross immorality, lust of their hearts, impurity, dishonor. The Bible says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. If you read through the entire first chapter of Romans, you would see our society right out the window today. It describes our society to the T in which you live. It is the town in which you live, the places that you work, everything on your television, the schools that you attend, the universities that we attend. This is the world today, abandoning the righteousness of God, the holiness of God for perversion for acts of indecency, and this describes the society in the first chapter of the book of Romans. And now, in verse 28, the Bible says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, the true God, any longer. This is, the world we live in today does not see fit to acknowledge God any longer in any way. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. He gets to define that. The world does not care. In fact, they hate it. They hate what God has called proper, what he has called right and true. Verse 29, this is the world in which we live being filled, filled, not a little bit, not in portion, filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full, again, not a little bit, Full of envy. People envy everything. They envy your life. They envy your marriage. They envy your health, money, possessions, joy, hope, peace. They are full of envy no matter what. Murder. The world is full of murder. If you can't see that, your eyes are shut. They are full of murder of every kind. Full of strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers. And look at this. Haters of God. The world hates God. God, they hate him. Insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil. What is just standard normal evil is not good enough anymore. People are inventing new kinds of evil that people haven't even thought of before. You see things on television and you hear things in the news and you hear things in schools and neighborhoods and societies and families and you look around and you're saying, I I, I didn't even know this was a thing. I didn't even know people could do such things. It's like invent, they invent new kinds of evil. Disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. It just described everything in which we live. There is no mercy, no love, no trust, no understanding, no obedience. Inventors of evil, they hate God. Verse 32, and although... They know the ordinance of God. They are aware of a general standard of moral and spiritual truth. God speaks through you, through your testimony, through your witness. God speaks through creation. God convicts by his Holy Spirit. God speaks to the conscience of man. They know in some degree the ordinance of God, although they know it, that those who practice such things are worthy of death They not only do the same things, but also give hearty. That's that's not just like, hey, good job, man. That is a standing, raucous applause 
of approval to those who practice them. Abominations to God. The world hates God. And they celebrate as a a smack in the face to God and his people. The Philistines are celebrating Dagon's apparent victory over Samson and the God that empowered him to do what he did. And they love, they want to smack Samson, the spirit of the God, whoever that represented, they slap it in the face and they celebrate. So they rejoiced and offered great sacrifice to Dagon for what had happened. That's what the world does today. They, they not only do the things that God has said are evil and wrong and unrighteous, they give hearty approval to others who do the same. They cheer it on. They cheer it on. Daring is almost as if they're daring. Society is daring God to show up. Daring his people. Daring you to stand for what you know to be true. Trying to intimidate you into some muted cowardice for the truth and and, and exchange it for some vanilla, soft, scared, general spirituality that means nothing, that has no specifics, no standard, no authority behind it whatsoever, daring you to step out of that from the fray and say, no, this is sin, this is righteousness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, daring you to show up. They were daring Samson. They're going to bring him out in a few minutes. Dare him to do. Call for Samson, they will say. What's he going to do? What's God going to do? I think about what our world celebrates. I'm not here to try to start a fight. I'm not here to just, just, just let the Bible show you some stuff, okay? There is a created order to things. Okay, just take some examples, Yeah. The book of Genesis, from the very beginning, the foundation of God and man in all of creation. There it is, all laid out. God speaks the world into existence. God makes man in his image. God makes man, male and female, it says, created he them. Then God brings the woman to the man and unites them in marriage, and you have Holy union. You have one flesh union. The two became one flesh, and then you have family created in an order and a standard handed to man from God. Now what you have is when somebody famous that was created by the Lord. Now, this is, please understand, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world and can redeem anybody from anything. Please understand that. That is true. Sin is nailed to the cross, but listen to the cheers of the world. When you have God who created in a certain order a human being as a man that dresses up as a woman and is held in the front of the whole world, what does the world do? They stand They tearfully, joyfully applaud and hand this person an award in front of all, daring anybody to speak against it. Daring God. They not only do the same, they give hearty approval. Look, this is how it should be. Last week, I don't stomp on graves. The Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, neither should we. Last week, the pioneer that brought to the mainstream of society in the biggest way ever, pornography, Hugh Hefner, breathes his last breath and dies at the age of 91. I don't know what he settled with the Lord on his deathbed. I don't know, and neither do you. And my fight is not against flesh and blood. You understand? But he's dead, and he's in eternity somewhere forever. He said, I want to be buried next to Marilyn Monroe so I can spend eternity next to Marilyn Monroe. What would be better than that? 
Sir, you may find out. I, I, don't, I don't say that. What a dangerous thing to say. You will find out what will be better than that. He dies. Satan used him, and he was deceived. Satan used him as a tool that was one of the most powerful enemies of every man, woman, and child in this room. He was a massive wrecking ball to every young boy, me included, to every young boy, every teenage boy, every godly husband, every young girl, every teenage girl, every wife. He was a destructive wrecking ball as a tool of the enemy, the prince of darkness, for decades, decades. He dies, and he's held up. And what does the world say? This man is a visionary. This man is a genius. A genius has died. I, I, I was in st stunned awe and wonder. This man is a visionary. This man is a pioneer. This man is a trailblazer. This man is an inspiration. This man is one of the strongest advocates for equal rights to women there has ever been? What are you saying? What, what are you talking about? This man, was, he was hailed by civil rights activists as a hero. This man is a hero. This man took away stigmas. This man set people free. Are you kidding me? A visionary. This man was a hero and an advocate and one of the strongest helps to pro-choice abortion we have had today. Well, no kidding. It was probably very necessary in his life. What are you saying? Full of murder, full of envy, untrustworthy, unloving, unholy. And the world stands, what do they say? They not only do the same, they give hearty approval to those who practice the same. If you don't think we are living every waking moment in Romans 1, you are deaf and blind. We're, and you know what? To say what I'm saying, listen, feel the tension in the room right now. You're like, you're a dead man. <laughs> you know why you think that? Because the world hates God. What's not true? What's being said that's not true? What's being said with the wrong heart, wrong spirit against the word of God? Nothing, but you are cringing because you know, you know what you feel? The hatred of the world for God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Tell me they don't hate him. They hate him. And to say these things, they're like, people are gonna go crazy about that. And you might be right. Because they hate God, and if they could gouge out my eyes, chain me in a prison, and bring me out, and mock me before men, trust me, they would. They would. If they could mute this truth, they would. They hate God. They hated him then, and they hate him now, and they hate him in you, John 15, back to the left. Jesus never lied. He never lied about what this life is. He never lied about what, it would, what would happen to the real followers. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, You know that it has hated me before it hated you. It hated him in the days of Samson. Hated him in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Hated him in the days of Noah. Hated him in the days of Nineveh. Hated him in the days of Israel. Hated him in the days of Jesus where it nailed him to the cross in hatred and anger. They called for a murderer instead of him. Said so it has hated me before it hated you, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own, man. If you're one of them, they love you. They hold you up and they cheer. No matter what you do against God, no matter what you speak, no matter what you slap in God's face, they hail you as a hero. And they love its own. A lot of Christians act like that. He says, but because you are not of the world, 
But I chose you out of the world because of this. The world hates you. Never lied. Other people will lie and leave this part out. Sell you something easier that isn't true. Jesus never lied. If they hate you, what's Jesus saying? It's okay, man. They hated me too. And I'm in you, and they hate you for me. Got to ask yourself, if, you've, if you follow the Lord, right? Let's, people here today, I, I follow the Lord. I'm a Christ follower. I know Jesus. I've come out of the waters of baptism. If you're a believer today and you haven't, we'd love to baptize you after the service, by the way. <laughs> says that, hey, if you follow the Lord, ask yourself this. Have you ever been condescended upon in any way? People just, what? Have you ever been made to feel crazy? Have you ever been made to feel an outcast by people that used to accept you and now they don't want you? Your family, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, even people in the so-called body of Christ. Have you ever been spoken against? Have you ever been slandered because of, not because you're an obnoxious jerk, don't be that, some people are just, they go around being obnoxious, and people are like, man, I don't, I don't really like you. Oh, persecuted! No, you're, you're, <laughs> you're just kind of a jerk. There's a such thing. Don't be that. But I'm talking with the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of the Word of God, and kindness and truth. You speak for the truth. You stand for the truth. You say the truth. You, you talk about sin when asked. You share the gospel when the door opens. You refrain from sin and you are noticed and people condescend. Has anyone ever laughed? You ever been cut off from social circles? You ever not gotten a promotion, been fired from a job, or not spoken to by a neighbor or family? Good job. <laughs> Good job. If you know the Lord, you've been following the Lord, and you're like... Can't say that I have. Huh. You ever wonder why not? Hope your light's not under a basket. Because when the darkness sees the light, it hates you. If it's never happened, ask yourself, I wonder why that is. Am I bold? Verse 25, Judges 16. They hated Samson because they hated God. Still true. They're all drunk. They're all pumped. They believe there is no threat. Their God is victorious. Their life of sin and rebellion is permitted. And they have an idea in their drunkenness. So happened in verse 25 when they were in high spirits. See, the world, the more victory they think they get over the Christ followers, the more they mute and stifle the truth, the more they believe they make us cowards, the more they believe they can blind you and put you in a prison and change their spirits raise. That they said, call for Samson. I have a arrow and a word written in the margin of my Bible. Mistake. You should have left it alone. You should have left them down there. This is a bad idea. But blind and shaved and chained and a grinder in the dark just wasn't enough. The party's going on. The celebration's going on, and it just somebody must have said, you know, it's, it's just not quite right without well, Samson here. Somebody, go get Samson. Whoever said that has gone down in eternal history as having uttered the worst idea ever. Call for Samson that he may amuse us. 
Let's, let's, let's mock this guy. It's not enough. It's not enough. We want to wallow and relish the apparent victory, and we want to bask in the mockery. It wasn't enough to arrest Jesus. It wasn't enough to beat Jesus. They had to put a crown of thorns. They had to put the purple robe. They had to put hail king of the Jews. They had to put a spear in his side. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And they paid off the guards at the tomb. It wasn't enough. Mistake. It was a mistake that will last in eternity because on the third day the soldiers that bowed and trembled called mistake this really was the son of God oh man what did we do they call for Samson as if they're calling a man out of the grave they say let him amuse us let's, let's mock him so they called for Samson from the prison and he entertained them and they made him stand between the pillars second mistake you guys Verse 26, I love it. Then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, what a humiliating gesture. All he needs now is a little boy. A little boy to lead him around. He can't see, you know, Samson. He, chains and hair are gone. He just, but what they didn't know is his hair had begun to grow. The power of the living God in him began to stir. He had repented. He had been humbled like so many in here have and you thought it was over and you called to God for mercy and here it came. Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, he doesn't write this part, but I'm pretty sure he said, hey son. It, he didn't. <laughs> Forgive me. Let me feel the pillars not just any pillars, and Samson knew. He'd probably seen the house of Dagon before, on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Put him between the pillars. Put him between them. They want to chain him up or something. I don't know. They want to throw things. They want to jab him. They want to fight him. He's blind. He can't defend. Tie him up between the pillars. Who knows what was being said, and Samson knew it was going to happen, and the little boy's like, I got to take you to the pillars, man. Is that right? He, uh, do me a favor. Put me between the big ones. I know there are two on which the whole house, the whole foundation, I know there are the, the cornerstone pillars on which this house rests. How about you put me between those ones? Okay. What difference does it make? He's defeated. There is no God but theirs. So on the house rests that I may lean against them. I mean, can I, can I, can I get the big one, son? Now the house was, I love this parenthetical note. God does it on purpose. He always does. He paints the whole picture for you. I wonder what it looked like. God, verse 27, God shows you everything just real quick before it goes to the next part. God's like, just so you know, this is what was going on. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And about 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. There were so many people, the place couldn't fit. It wasn't that big of a place. But there were these foundational pillars that were tied to some kind of infrastructure to the whole building that wasn't that big. It was just a temple to an idol. And they're all there so they couldn't fit. So they're all up on the roof looking out. Right, you guys got to see this. They're bringing him out. They're bringing him out. Look at this kid. He can't even see. He's stumbling around, you know. Were they mocking him? Were they whipping him? Were they dancing him back? He can't walk. Did he fall down? Look at this. You got to see this. They're all up on the roof. Verse 28, Samson called to the Lord and said, for the first time in a long time. Oh, Lord God. There it is. There's where the power comes from. Last time he said, I. I will go out and shake myself free. No, he won't. Sometimes you and I, we, I I'm going to do it, man. What God called me to do, or God called me to go, and he, I, I got this. No, you don't. But when you lean on the power, oh, Lord God. He remembered, he remembered in the darkness of that prison, oh Lord God, some of the best things that ever happened to people in here, you've been humbled and thrown in a prison because of your sin. Oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. Oh God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. How about one more time, Lord? How about one more time, oh Lord God? 
Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. It said that twice, on which the house rests, and the house rested, and braced himself against them, the one with his right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, oh man, the horror in that crowd. Let me die with the Philistines. And I bet for a split second, a raucous laughter occurred in the palace until they heard the cracking and the creaking and the gravel and the stones started breaking and falling and shifting and the quaking of the room. He said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house, the house in which they trusted, the house of their idolatry, the house of their mockery and their false God fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed in his life. On which the house rested. They believed in that house. They believed in that God. And as Jesus would say, it's a foundation of sand. They were never founded on the rock. And the storm of God's wrath, of God's righteous judgment came and crushed that house justifiably to the ground on their sinful, hard-hearted heads. Then his brothers and all his father's household came down, took him and brought him up, and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol, the place where the story began in the tomb of Manoah, his father, and he had judged Israel 20 years. God's justice, avenge me just this once, he said. Avenge me. Oh, Lord God, people ask. Maybe you're asking, where's the justice? You look around the world, you see violence. What do you want to talk about? You want to talk about violence? Where's the justice? Where's God? You look at persecution. You want to talk about that? You want to talk about celebration of perversion and twisted immorality? And it goes not only unchecked, it goes celebrated and in your face daring you to speak against it. Where's God? People that name the name of Christ here and around the world arrested, persecuted, muted, and murdered. Where's God? Where's the justice? If there is a God, how this How this, how long, from where and from when will righteousness come? If he's there, then when is it going to happen? And does he even see this? Has he lost control? Oh, buddy. No, he has not. I assure you, God sees it all. And justice, listen to me, those that are faint of heart, those that are asking questions, those that struggle with what you see and what you hear, and you ask, where is the justice? Listen to me. You may not see justice in this life. You may not see, and you will not see, adequate justice among the broken systems of man. But the Bible says that I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne of God, and the books were opened, and every Man was judged according to that which was written in the books. Everything. Do you understand? Jesus said, every idle, passive word men shall speak, they will give an account for in the days of judgment. Nobody ever for all time has gotten away with anything. God wrote it down. God wrote it down, and they run for the hills, and they run for cover. They manipulate systems, and they manipulate people, and it seems as if there is no justice, and they arrogantly continue down this no-justice path of evil, and we ask where, when, and how. I assure you, it's all written in the books, and they will meet divine, eternal justice soon enough. Take courage, those that are disheartened. Revelation chapter 6, you want to see it? You want a snapshot of it? Warm your heart. God is coming. And his justice and his righteous indignation for sin and iniquity that falls on everybody's shoulders, the mockery, the persecution, the wickedness, the cheering of evil, justice is coming. And they will not escape it. The Bible says, There's a snapshot of the end of all things that will come as sure as you and I walked in the door this morning. John gives a vision that he had of the end. 
Revelation 6, 9, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, the lamb, the king, the Lord, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming into town on a donkey and he said, behold the lamb of God. When the lamb comes, early on John saw no one was worthy to break the seals of the scroll and I wept and behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb without blemish or spot stepped forward and he took the seal, the scroll and broke the seals. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because the world hates God and his word. Those who had been killed and slain and because of the testimony, look at this, which they had maintained. You have the guts. You have the grit. You have the faith to maintain your testimony in the face of any storm. They maintained their testimony even unto death. And they cried in verse 10 with a loud voice saying what some of us say, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord, holy and true? Will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They wondered the same thing. They were slain, they're in heaven, and they see just unchecked persecution. How long, O Lord? What are you going to do about it? When are you going to do it? Where are you, God? I love this part. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. Jesus comes over, right? How long, oh Lord? This has happened to us. It's happening to them. How long until you do something? Just hang on a minute. I got this. Here's your robe of faithfulness. Here's your robe of righteousness. You stand over here and you hang on a minute because I'm coming. I see it. I've written it down and I am coming for them. How long, O Lord? It says, and there was given to a white robe. Rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. And then there's a moment in the misery and the pain in the dungeons of the world. There is a moment. John said in verse 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, the lamb. There was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood. Stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky Understand, the earthly, heavenly reality was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. And every, every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And then what happened? Then the kings of the earth and the great men, all those visionaries, all those pioneers, all those billionaires that have profited and leveraged power through sin, through greed, through abomination, the kings of the earth, the great men, the commanders, the rich, the strong, and every slave and free man. What did they do? Stand and slap God? What do they do? Slap his people? Pers they hid themselves in the cave and among the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. They know now who they picked a fight with, and he has come, and he has their name on his mind, and there's nowhere to go. And they try to hide under the creation that is under his control, and they will find nothing. And it says, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Nobody outside of the blood of Jesus. Do you understand? Justice is a coming. God is coming. The wrath of the Lamb. Doesn't matter how great, doesn't matter what you did, doesn't matter the power you have. When Jesus comes, they will know that he's coming for him and they're coming for them and there's nowhere to go. One day he brought the house down for Samson in a little temple somewhere in Gaza. It is coming one day. He will bring the house down on evil. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you stand please? Heavenly Father, we just proclaim your victory, your glory, 
your awesome wonder and power. We are thankful for the encouragement of the truth. Hearten somebody today. Encourage somebody today. Give them strength. Give them hope. Give them answers and assurance. Let us be bold. Let us be the light. The Lamb has purchased us. The Lamb without blemish or spot. And you are coming again. Calling us to your right hand. And you will avenge evil. You will take what is yours. And we proclaim you king as you reign today. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.